All right, guys, it's the chapter you've been waiting for. Chapter 5 will focus on viruses and how they replicate. We think of viruses as infecting just us humans, but they have the ability to infect virtually every type of organism from bacteria to plants. We can find these viruses in numerous amounts in just a single drop of ocean water. It took a while for scientists to determine the cause of viral infections. Our good friend Louis Pasteur had the notion that rabies was caused by some organism that was smaller than bacteria. He's actually the one that coined the term virus. One of the earliest viruses discovered was one that infected the tobacco plant. It was later that Loeffler and Frosch identified a virus that caused foot and mouth disease in cattle, which is similar to hand, foot, and mouth disease in humans. Scientists discovered viruses when they realized that whenever they ran infectious fluids through a filter, the filtrate was still infectious. This proved to them that something smaller than a bacteria, which the filter was intended to trap, caused disease. So there are a lot of questions researchers and scientists have about viruses. They wonder if they can be considered true organisms, as well as how did they help in the development of our three major cell types. They also question what specific characteristics they have and how they play a role in disease. The big question is that how can something so, so small and something that's not considered a cell be responsible for worldwide pandemics and death? There are also links to cancer as well. There's a big debate about these viruses. On one hand, they can't replicate unless they have a host, so they should be just be considered infectious agents. On the other hand, even though they're not cells, they are complex enough to control cells to synthesize what they need. When the viruses infect cells, they have the ability to alter the genetics of that organism. We know that they played a role in the evolution of our three major cell types. An interesting fact is that a small portion of our DNA contains a small percentage of DNA that comes from viruses. They even make up to 20% of a bacterium's genome. The viruses are considered to be parasites, as in order for them to replicate, they must infect a host, whether it be a human or a bacterium. Once they invade the host, they hijack the cell's machinery for its benefit. Let's discuss some key facts about viruses. We just mentioned that they're parasites and that they are found in abundance on Earth. Much like bacteria, they're ubiquitous, meaning we can find them anywhere. They're much smaller than bacteria and are not considered to be cells. They're made up of a capsid, which is a protein shell, that surrounds their genetic information. The genetic information that they possess is either DNA or RNA, but it can't contain both. This DNA can either be double-stranded or single-stranded. The same goes for RNA. On the surface, they have spikes, which enable them to attach to a host cell and invade. These spikes are very specific, much like a key is specific for a particular lock. Once they gain entry, they use the host cell's enzymes to make more of itself. They do so because they don't have the specific enzymes for basic reactions and synthesis of proteins. For a while, viruses were classified based on what type of host they infected and what types of diseases they caused. Now the classification systems focus on the hosts and diseases associated with them, along with what they look like, what they're made of, and similarities between them. As of now, there are eight orders and 38 families which can change in an instant. We know that they are small, the smallest being 20 nanometers, while viruses like herpes simplex can be about 150 nanometers in length. Some are so thin that it's even difficult to visualize with an electron microscope. This picture shows the relative size of bacteria compared to the largest of the viruses and the smallest. Just to kind of give you an idea to the size difference, 
thousands of viruses could fit in one bacterium. Here are some electron microscope images of some viruses. When we look at viruses, they don't look like any cells and they don't have the tools required for metabolic processes or protein synthesis. All they have are structures that enable them to bind to a host cell and enter it. They have the external capsid, genetic information, and maybe a single enzyme or two. This capsid that surrounds their genetic information is made up of proteins. And when we consider it, along with the nucleic acid, we call it a nucleocapsid. If a virus just has this nucleocapsid and no additional outer structure, it's considered naked. Those viruses that have an additional structure that surrounds a capsid are called enveloped viruses. Typically, this outer envelope comes from the host cell's membrane as the virus takes a piece of it when it's released. Spikes are essential for viruses to be able to attach to a host cell and can be found on both naked and enveloped viruses. A virion is a virus that is capable of causing an infection. Figure A shows us the naked virus with the capsid, spikes, and nucleic acid. The enveloped virus in B looks very similar, but in addition to the capsid, has the outer membrane. The bulk of the virus is made up by the capsid, which is assembled using capsomeres. There are two different types of capsids that we can see in viruses, helical and icosahedral. As I mentioned a second ago, enveloped viruses are formed when they take a piece of the host cell's membrane as they're released. They can also form from the nuclear envelope or the endoplasmic reticulum. The presence of the envelope gives the virus the ability to alter its shape due to the added flexibility. Here we can see the helical capsids, which can be arranged like a tube in the naked tobacco mosaic virus, or can be wound like in the enveloped viruses, like the influenza virus. The icosahedral capsids are 3D and have 20 sides. The adenovirus is considered a naked virus, whereas the hepatitis B virus and herpes simplex virus are both enveloped. Then we get these guys that look like aliens. This is a complex capsid and can be seen in bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. The genome of a virus differs. Some have DNA, while some have RNA as their nucleic acid. The viruses don't have a significant amount of genes. The hepatitis B virus only has four genes. Some herpes viruses have hundreds compared to E. coli, which has about 4,000 genes, and us, who have 20,000. They have genes that they need to invade a host and take over their machinery. DNA-based viruses can either be single or double-stranded. We can also see linear and circular double-stranded DNA. Typically, we find RNA as single-stranded in viruses. There are several types. Positive sense RNA can automatically be used to make proteins, while negative sense RNA has to be converted to positive sense before proteins can be synthesized. Sometimes, genes are found on their own piece of RNA, and these are considered segmented. Retroviruses are unique in that they have special enzymes that enable them to make DNA from RNA. This table is great for you to see the different types of DNA and RNA-based viruses. 
This is a good one to study so that you know the virus and what diseases they're each associated with. Viruses come prepackaged with enzymes like polymerase, which can be used to make DNA or RNA, replicase that can be used to copy RNA, and some retroviruses have reverse transcriptase, which they use to make DNA from RNA. Although they don't have genes for metabolism, they figured a way around that and use the host cell's metabolic enzymes. Sometimes they even take things away from the host, like ribosomes, and tRNA. The way that a virus gains control of the host and replicates determines how it's transmitted, what type of damage it does to the host, how our immune system responds, and how we control the spread of them. We're about to get into how viruses replicate in an animal cell. All viruses are different in terms of how long it takes from adsorption to release. It could be 8 hours as in poliovirus or 36 in some of the herpes viruses. Let's look at adsorption or attachment. The only way that a virus can invade a host is to have the correct key to get in. It has to have the appropriate spike to bind to receptors on the surface of the host cell. The host range is that there are only certain types, certain cell types a virus can infect. For instance, hepatitis B can only infect liver cells in humans, while poliovirus can infect humans, apes, and monkey intestinal and nerve cells. Rabies can target a wide variety of cells in all mammals, so it kind of has a master key, if you will. If the host cell doesn't have the appropriate receptor, the virus can't attach and invade. This is why a dog's liver cell cannot be infected with humans' hepatitis A. Vi a. Viruses are also specific as to what types of tissues they infect. The hepatitis viruses infect the liver, while mumps targets the salivary glands. Here we can see the virus using its spikes to attach to the receptors on the surface of the host cell. You can also see that it's an enveloped virus. The next step in the life cycle of an animal virus is penetration followed by uncoating. In some cases, the entire virus may enter the host cell or it may just be its genetic information. Whenever a whole virus enters a host, it happens via endocytosis. With an envelope virus, the envelope fuses with the host cell's membrane, which then releases the nucleocapsid inside. In figure A, we can see the attachments using the spikes, followed by the engulfment or penetration into the host using a vesicle. Once it's in, it makes itself comfortable and strips down, which releases the nucleic acid in this case, DNA. This uncoating allows for the DNA to be free for replication and protein synthesis. In figure B, we see the attachment using the spikes as well, but it's a little different in that the envelope fuses with the cell's membrane. The nucleocapsid enters the cell rather than the entire virus. Uncoating then occurs like we see in figure A. Once the virus is in and has made itself comfortable, replication then begins. If it's a DNA-based virus, this occurs in the nucleus of the host cell. If the vi virus is RNA-based, then replication occurs in the cytoplasm. Of course, retroviruses like HIV work a bit different and can synthesize DNA from RNA. A DNA-based virus that is double-stranded will undergo transcription in the nucleus and produce mRNA, which will then be translated to viral proteins in the cytoplasm. Now remember, 
The virus doesn't have essential enzymes, so they use the host cell's DNA polymerase. In the light phase, viral proteins are synthesized, and they then begin to make copies of the viral nucleic acid, and they begin to assemble the capsids. In the assembly process, the virus uses proteins and nucleic acids that were made during synthesis. More vital viral particles are made, and they are then released from the host cell. This number can vary depending on the size of the virus, as well as how healthy the original host cell was. On your left, you can see the assembly and maturation of a new virus, and you can see it budding from the host cell. This is one way that a virus acquires an envelope. In figure B, you can see an image of the HIV leaving a T cell via budding. Let's briefly run through the stages again, but for RNA viruses. Adsorption or attachment is when the virus uses spikes to attach to specific receptors on the surface of the host cell. It then gains entry to the cell and enters, whether it be the entire virus or just the nucleocapsid. The virus then strips down during the encoding phase to expose the nucleic acids. Next up is synthesis, which is the creation of new viruses. Single-stranded RNA positive goes to work immediately and viral proteins are made from it. It then makes copies of itself to make negative single-stranded RNA to make more positive single-stranded RNA. Essential proteins and enzymes are then synthesized using the host cell. Once the virus has made spikes and capsomeres, the capsid is then assembled along with the insertion of spikes. Finally comes the release, which can occur either through lysis, which is a rupturing of the cell, or via budding. The host cell can see different types of damage, and these changes are called cytopathic effects. The shape of the host cell may change, along with its size. There may also be disturbances on the inside of the cell. Inclusion bodies, which could be a collection of viruses in the cell or damaged organelles, may be seen. Sometimes, a lot of host cells that have been damaged come together and appear to be giant cells, as in respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. As the damage accumulates, most host cells are killed. On your left, the image shows epithelial cells that have been infected with herpes simplex virus. You can see the large syncytia that have formed. On the right, we can see inclusion bodies formed by cytomegalovirus. In some instances, the host cell almost befriends the virus, if you will, and is not immediately damaged. This relationship can last a few weeks to years. A provirus is one that incorporates its DNA into the DNA of a host cell. The measles virus is an example. This virus can hide out in brain cells for years, which can lead to damage and loss of function of the nervous system. It's a rare complication, but it can be deadly. In a chronic latent state, the virus can be reactivated by things like stress or hormones. The herpes simplex virus is known for this, as well as herpes zoster, which causes chicken pox and shingles. There is a moderate percentage of cancers that are linked to viruses. What happens is this process caused, caused transformation in which the viral genes directly cause cancer or they produce proteins that prevent the host cell from tightly regulating the cell cycle. These cells that have been transformed grow uncontrollably. The chromosomes change, 
receptors on their surface change, and cell division occurs on repeat. Some viruses associated with cancer are the papillomavirus, linked to cervical cancer, herpes viruses, particularly the Epstein-Barr virus, which is linked to Burkitt's lymphoma. There is also the hepatitis B virus associated with liver cancer and a relative of HIV, HTLV-1. Let's look at the effects of these oncoviruses. Some may incorporate the viral oncogenes into the host cell's DNA, which leads to viral proteins that affect growth regulation. Some viral genes directly have an effect on the host cell's oncogenes and turns on expression of them, again leading to uncontrolled cell growth. Some oncoviruses produce viral proteins that affect the host cell's ability to regulate growth. Let's discuss viruses that infect bacteria. These guys are called bacteriophages. The majority of them are double-stranded DNA-based, but some have RNA as well. Typically, what happens when a bacteria is infected with the virus, it undergoes changes that make it more harmful to us. It's a complex nucleocapsid, and then it doesn't have the spikes as we saw in animal viruses, but it has tail tail pins and fibers that it uses to attach and penetrate. There are two life cycles of a virus, the lytic and lysogenic cycle. We will look at your lytic cycle first. The first and second step are the same as an animal virus. We see adsorption and penetration. There's no encoding, rather the bacteriophage jumps to the replication and synthesis stage. It then starts assembling new virions and after they mature, they rupture the cell and are released. In the lysogenic cycle, after penetration, the bacteriophage may incorporate its DNA into the bacterial DNA. This may provide beneficial genes for the bacterium, such as toxin production. It can then revert to the lytic cycle. As I mentioned, in this lysogenic cycle, a prophage is formed, where viral DNA has incorporated itself into bacterial DNA. Induction then occurs, where the cell then becomes active and starts replicating and reverts to the lytic cycle. In some instances, a bacterium may benefit from the viral DNA incorporating itself into their DNA. The term lysogenic conversion is used to describe situations in which bacterium gains a trait it didn't have before from a bacteriophage. C. diphtheriae, before being infected with the virus, was non-pathogenic, but after a virus infected it, it gained the ability to produce a toxin and be harmful to us. The same goes for Vibrio cholera and Clostridium botulinum. So how are viruses grown or cultivated in the lab? It's not as, si as simple as growing up bacteria. Viruses require live cells because remember, they can't do anything without a host. In vivo methods, use animals as well as bird tissues, like chick embryos. In vitro, uses cells or tissues. There are many reasons to grow viruses. Of course, the big one being to identify the virus causing infections, for vaccine development, and for research. There are a wide variety of animals used, including mice, rats, and rabbits. Sometimes insects and non-primates are used. We talked about specific receptors for the viral spikes to bind to, so that determines what animal is used as well.
Bird embryos are often used as it has all the nutrients it needs to survive and it's a sterile environment. Researchers use tiny holes to inje inject the embryos with the virus they're trying to grow or study. Animal cells are grown in vitro instead of using an animal. They're grown in a completely sterile environment in a special medium. They're grown in a mono layer which gives researchers the ability to directly see the effects of the virus on the cells. Researchers can make observations to determine if damage or lysis occurs. They can visually detect plaques, which are clearings seen in the cell sheet. On your left, is a microscopic view of cells prior to being infected with the virus, compared to the right, which shows the cytopathic effects after being infected with the virus. Bacteriophage damage can also be detected by the observation of plaques on medium in which bacteria are grown on. Let's look at non-cellular infectious agents other than viruses. Prions are solely made up of protein. A lot of research is still being done on these guys. They tend to deposit themselves in brain tissue. They're associated with things like creutzfeldt jakob disease, which causes damage to the nervous system and death. They also cause mad cow disease and Scheidrager syndrome. Satellite viruses rely on other viruses. The adeno-associated virus was once only thought to replicate in the presence of adenovirus, but that's no longer the case. The delta agent only expresses itself if hepatitis B is around and can exacerbate damage to the liver. Viroids target plants like tomatoes, cucumbers, and citrus and are only made up of RNA. It's almost impossible to determine just how many viral infections occur worldwide. There are a wide variety of viruses. Those that occur everywhere, like the common cold. Those seen predominantly in certain regions, like dengue fever. Those with high death rates, like Ebola as well as those that cause disabilities like polio. We will be discussing in detail all of these later this semester. Last but not least, how do we treat viral infections? Antibiotics don't work because there's no cell wall or enzymes for them to target. The problem with the development of antivirals is that it's difficult to find drugs that will focus in on the virus and not damage the host. The majority of drugs developed target one of the stages of the virus's life cycle. It's easier for us to prevent viral infections through the use of vaccines rather than to develop antiviral drugs.